beginning in the 1990s and accelerated by 9-11, we see an important shift globally in military strategic thinking around cyberspace as a new domain within which wars will be fought and won. In the 1990s, the internet evolves into something new. Uh, it becomes more widespread, it becomes more useful, and it becomes more civilian in its nature uh, as business takes over. And as a result, we start to use it for all sorts of uh, tasks. Um, and we gain this dependence on it. The same story plays out on the military side, where it becomes a vast repository of information to its use for planning and the like. And so the result is that we start to look at the internet as no longer this kind of science fiction-like place, to something that we all depend on, uh, whether we're a business, whether we're a civilian, whether we're a, we're a military. The response to that is, of course, it becomes viewed as a realm of conflict. Uh, so militaries start to worry about, hold it, if I depend more and more on this, how do I make sure the bad guy doesn't take it away from me? And in turn, if the other side's depending more and more on it, how do I take it away from them? And so we see the also not just the visualizations of cyber warfare becoming um, real, but we start to see planning for it. We start to see organization on it. We start to see, for example, the US military build the first units designed to fight and win wars in cyberspace, and in turn, the same thing playing out in nations like Russia, China, Israel. And as a result, we start seeing amongst most states the development of offensive military capabilities to fight wars in cyberspace. And an important development was the Stuxnet virus in 2010. Built by US and Israeli intelligence agencies, Stuxnet was a malicious computer worm that targeted and caused substantial damage to Iran's nuclear enrichment programs. Stuxnet was a very important threshold uh, in cyber warfare. Up until that time, I think people rightly question whether we would even see a, a warfare in cyberspace. And to, the, to this day, you have skeptics who believe that cyber warfare will never take place. Um, Stuxnet demonstrated that it's possible, that you could take a virus and you could use uh, software, information in other words, to bring about physical destruction. <clears throat> in this case, sabotage of Iranian nuclear enrichment facilities. Stuxnet was something new, or in a certain way we crossed a Rubicon with it. It was the very first digital weapon. So in some ways, it was like every other weapon in history. It caused physical damage to the target. You know, whether you're talking about a spear, you're talking about a bullet, you're talking about this software, it caused physical damage to the target. Uh, in the case of Stuxnet, it uh, in essence sabotaged uranium nuclear research, didn't steal information from them. We knew how to build nuclear weapons. Um, it uh, instead caused the equipment to physically damage itself and what it was working on. You couldn't touch it. It was a bunch of zeros and ones. It was just software. And that was something fundamentally new. And as a result of this first act of war sabotage occurring through cyberspace, we now witness an arms race unfolding in cyberspace. It's important because other countries take notice and they begin to think about, well, you know, if, if this uh, had a demonstrated effect, we must be able to anticipate and maybe even develop our own capabilities. So you have a classic uh, arms race logic that, that uh, unfolds. Um, and I think you also have a lot of resources being put into research and development of cyber warfare capabilities. This is something we can document. You could look at military spending on cyber, country by country, look at what they're researching, um, Kinetic cyber warfare is very much a real risk today, thanks to the Stuxnet example. But alongside militaries clashing in cyberspace, we now also see entire societies colliding in a new phenomenon called net war. The concept of net war was famously coined in 1993 in a groundbreaking article entitled Cyber War is Coming 
published by John Arkea and David Ronfeld, two researchers at the Rand Corporation. And what Arkea and Ronfeld argued was that in an age of net war, reality itself would become contested. Net war meant that states would deploy strategies to disrupt, damage, or modify what a target population knows or thinks it knows. It was the anticipation back in 1993 that information itself could be turned into a strategic weapon. This form of net war has become a daily reality today. And the best example can be found in today's Russia. Here, as Peter Singer shows, the old Soviet-style information warfare has entered a period of renaissance. Over the last decade, an association of over 70 education and research institutions, coordinated by the Russian Federal Security Service, seeks to utilize cyberspace to control the flow of information at home, whilst also using it to divide its enemies abroad. It shouldn't surprise us that uh, now Russia is one of the best at playing this game when it comes to the internet. And it's not just that they pioneered it, it's that they made deep investments. Um, so uh, about a little more over a decade ago, they looked around and when you saw all of these, what we saw, the, the color revolutions in various um, Eastern European states and parts of the former Soviet Union, they began to see that the internet was threatening to them. The vast spread of information was threatening to them. They said, hold it, okay, we wanna do a better job of controlling that, what's coming at us, and that happens through lots of different means of censorship and the like, but also beginning to use it as a weapon against those we want to stop, against our Western adversaries. And so they invest deeply. They spend millions of dollars in setting up everything from um, research institutions and universities to study this, to uh, literal military units and intelligence units designed to go after it. And again, they range from people studying the psychology of this to what they call the troll factories, which are basically uh, people um, and kind of, you know, what's interesting is they're, they're millennials or what we would call mostly hipsters who sit in offices all day long, almost like a factory. They're lined up and their job is literally to try and influence others online. And so they're running multiple personas. Sometimes they might be arguing with you, consuming your time online. Uh, other ways they're trying to uh, persuade you, to turn you to their cause. Other times they're trying to um, spread information or misinformation so that they can have people working on behalf of them. Again, it was a phrase uh, back in the day that the Soviets pioneered called useful idiots. And it was basically people that um, didn't directly agree with you, but you could manipulate them to help your cause. And we see a huge amount of that going on when we think about social media and in particular kind of groups like an Infowars or the like where they are taking Russian propaganda and repurposing it. And as a result, they're basically serving um, the cause. So I think of the, you know, so the, the point that's going on here is you see this wide array of efforts. It's also become aligned with um, uh, more traditional hacking. So for example, I'm stealing information like what we saw in the breaches, you know, everywhere from the German parliament to uh, political parties in the United States. And then I'm taking that information and then I'm using my social media arms to try and spread it in a way designed to embarrass, discredit, spread lies, um, muck up the waters. This idea of using the internet not just in the traditional sense of cybersecurity, but to limit the flow of information or to spread false information is also something we can see very prominently in the case of China. With what has become known as the Great Firewall of China, the Chinese government has one of the most sophisticated systems of internet censorship. An army of over 2 million employees has been hired to decide what kind of information can enter into China, which websites need to be blocked, and even which particular phrases or words should be banned. So, for example, 
any references to Tiananmen Square are filtered out by default. But China has now gone one step further with what they call the social scoring system. We now have the move towards um, you know, something that would, that would do Orwell proud, which is the social scoring system, where people, there will be certain things that are banned, but in turn, you will receive a score based on your behavior and your networks, your friends, your family's behavior online. How much are you pushing the party line versus are you saying things that aren't good? And then that score is something Thing that will reverberate back in the real world, where it might determine what school your kids get into, to whether you get a loan, to what kind of jobs you get. So it's um, this, this very developed model of carrots and sticks. And alongside this army of internet censors, China, similar to Russia, has employed an army of internet arguers. People who are hired to go online and argue with others be this inside China or outside. So if we browse through cyberspace today, what we see literally everywhere is a development where the state has asserted its role in the global commons we now call the internet. From changes in military strategic thinking that view cyberspace as a domain in which war is being waged, to sophisticated systems of internet censorship all the way to phenomena such as net war, where reality itself is up for grabs. And this development is contrary to the views held by those who set up the internet in the first place. Cyberspace was supposed to be a technology facilitating the free flow and exchange of information. It was even seen as the most pure form of democracy, where everyone's voice would be heard, and where information would be freely accessed and shared. And yet, what we see instead across the world is the opposite. In the eyes of states, cyberspace has become too important to be left to itself.